So today we're going to talk a little bit about what is space weather, uh, how it, the impacts that uh, space weather event can have on society, uh, space weather missions, uh, sort of the status of where we are, uh, what missions have flown, and and where uh, and where we are in that, and and basically the real thrust here is is what is the space weather threat to our way of life here, and how do we manage that threat? So before I get into this, uh, just out of curiosity, how many people here uh, have heard of solar flares? Okay, 100%. How about a coronal mass ejection? Uh, okay, we're down to about 60%. Okay, let's wind the clock back to 1999. How many knew what a solar flare was in 1999? Okay, how many knew what a coronal mass ejection was in 1999? Okay, so we're now we're down to about 30 percent. All right, so, uh, so uh, basically our knowledge and understanding of space weather uh, has evolved uh, over centuries, uh, accelerated very significantly in the last uh, couple of decades. Uh, we are just now coming to understand the impact that space weather has on our society and the potential threat it has to our way of life. Let's go uh, on to the next slide, please. Okay, so the primary constituents of uh, space weather are solar flares. Uh, a solar flare is basically a electromagnetic uh, wave that propagates from the sun to the earth and interacts with our magnetosphere. Uh, I think we've all probably learned about that, which is why the response is so high, probably when we were in, uh, in high school. Uh, coronal mass ejections is something we've uh, really Emerging to the public knowledge just more recently is is a ma uh, massive field of electrically charged debris. This is electrons, protons, and stripped atomic nuclei that are generated from the collapse of a solar magnetic field line. Uh, coronal mass ejections uh, really represent a potential serious disruption uh, to our uh, the global infrastructure. Solar flares may or may not be associated with a CME event and. The other thing about solar activity is that uh, it tends to peak every 11 years. Uh, So-called solar maxes come basically on an 11-year cycle, and lo and behold, 2013 uh, is a solar max year. So we are ramping up uh, in solar activity, although less than uh, anticipated, and it is supposed to peak out in 2013, and then the next solar max would be uh, 11 years later. Let's focus in on coronal mass uh, ejection. As I said, these have the greatest potential to disrupt uh, life on Earth. Uh, a coronal mass ejection can have a mass of up to 1.8 billion tons. Okay, so think of that in terms of 1.8 billion F-150 pickup trucks being hurled at the Earth in a coronal mass ejection event. All right, that, that's, that's a lot of uh, mass. Okay, the velocity on these things has a tremendous spread on it. They average a little about 490 kilometers per second, can be up to 3,200 kilometers per second, and uh, as, as slow as a 20 kilometers per second. Uh, you know, travel times are one thing, but let's translate that into time, or tra uh, velocities is one thing, let's translate that into time. Uh, the time to, for a coronal mass uh, ejection to travel to the Earth can be up to 87 days, so you know we can uh, plenty of warning there. Could be as little as a half a day under very extraordinary circumstances, and typically they run about three and a half days. All right. So uh, when uh, a coronal mass ejection occurs, we generally see it coming maybe a day or two in advance. When it actually happens, we probably can optically observe it within 15 minutes. Uh, and confirm it, uh, but the issue is: is is it going to come at us at Earth? Is it going to is it going to interfere with us? And quite frankly, the, when we know it's absolutely going to impinge on Earth, there's probably as little as 30 minutes of warning time. Okay, that's when it's confirmed. All right, so uh, let, we'll get into that a little bit uh, later when we talk about the uh, the architecture we have in place. Okay, so how does space weather impact us? Um, okay, so the great majority of space weather events uh, are transient 
and incidental disruptions to our daily lives. Uh, it might interfere with uh, radio uh, transmissions and communications. Uh, might only last for an hour or two. Uh, it is, in terms of life-threatening aspects of it, uh, it is a direct threat to human health and safety for astronauts and passengers on polar routed flights. Uh, the reason for that it can get exposed to excess radiation. The reason is is that uh, the, magne the magnetic fields that surround Earth essentially protect us from uh, radiation from the sun uh, and coronal mass ejections. They basically perform a shield. Though that shield is at its weakest point on the poles. So that's why uh, there's a little more vulnerability there. Uh, so astronauts say wave, radio wave telecommunication cable disruption, just the size of a, a cable going across the ocean, picks up magnetic fields that can uh, uh, actually interfere with that. Uh, it impacts satellites. It can actually bring a satellite down uh, by causing damage to the electronics on board a satellite. Uh, the other aspect of it is, is it creates a heavier atmosphere that the satellites travel through. So in lower Earth orbits, like our uh, weather satellites, or many of our weather satellites, uh, it creates additional drag on the satellite, which can force it to go lower in orbit. And, and uh, if this happens often enough, uh, the satellites will consume their fuel, readjusting their orbits, and it will shorten their lifetimes. Okay, let's see. Okay, so, so those are some of the uh, irritations that space weather can cause. Uh, but the most serious threat from space weather actually results from a cascading effect uh, that can result from a uh, catastrophic disruption of our power grids. Um, when these coronal mass ejections hit the Earth, they can, uh, what are called ground-induced currents, they can elevate uh, g circulating ground currents within the system and, uh, and basically uh, cause a lot of damage to the transformers in the distribution of power throughout, uh, throughout our nation. Okay, uh, I'll come back to that a little bit uh, later. So, okay, as far as the likelihood of a significant CMA event, uh, these happen pretty frequently. Big ones happen often enough. Uh, it was recently reported at the Applied Physics Lab, they had a, a seasons conference on space weather, that the probability of a Carrington level event, which Liam referred to in his opening, in the next decade is in the 6 to 12 percent range. Let me state that in a different, a different terminology. That basically equates it to the Carrington event happened 150 years ago, sort of corresponds to a 100-year event that we could expect. Okay. The problem with that is that we have not, we have no footprint, we have no geological footprint of coronal mass ejections. We've only had 150 years to observe these events. All right. So we're projecting this as a 100-year event when we've only observed it for a 150-year event. When we talk about a 100-year rain storm, you know, we have geological records that go back centuries, uh, millenniums, that are embedded in our uh, geology that give us a, a re track record where we can really come up with meaningful statistics on what constitutes a 100-year storm. So th the Carrington event, the 100-year storm, is something that could easily be a higher probability event we just haven't had the wherewithal or the means to observe what the true statistics are. Okay, so the other aspect of this is that, okay, so there's the probability of there being a significant storm uh, in that class. Uh, that in and of itself is not, uh, does not stand alone. We also have to look at what's the probability of our power grid surviving reasonably intact to such an event. And as we sit here today, nobody has an answer on that. Okay, so this is a huge uh, risk is basically a lack of knowledge. Everything, if we know something, it's not a risk because we know it. Okay, well, when we don't know something, it represents a risk. And our failure or our lack of understanding of, of the impact, the probabilistic impact 
of on our power grids is something that we do not understand in adequate detail today. Okay, so let's talk about, you know, what is the impact of the power grid going down? Uh, so basically in uh, 2009, the National Science uh, Academy reported, uh, cited a vulnerability of, and there's, this is uh, an error on the chart, of 2,000 ground transformers and 140 million pole transformers uh, are vulnerable to coronal mass uh, ejections that induce ground currents that can blow those transformers. Basically, because of production capacity limits, material limits, et cetera, et cetera, uh, if that entire system in a worst case scenario were to go down, it would take 10 years of full production capacity as it currently exists to replace those transformers uh, at the cost of what is grossly estimated at a trillion dollars. Okay, um, so let, let's just pause for a minute and think, okay, I'm going to throw the light, turn the switch off, and when that switch off, power is not going to come on across this country for, say, one year. Okay, think about what that means. Okay. Uh, it gets into our, the distribution of our food and water supply. Uh, it gets fuel distribution. Uh, Hurricane Sandy was indicative of how you can have all the gas in the world, but if you can't get it to where it needs to be, it doesn't do you any good. Uh, limited delivery of health care. You have problems with your water sanitation. You got about three weeks and you're going to have wa uh, problems with your health uh, health care system. Uh, economic disarray. Uh, we are so dependent upon electronic transactions uh, for everything. Uh, buying groceries, uh, buying gas, of which you, there may not be any to buy, but if you did go to buy them, there would be no means to, uh, to execute the transactions. Anyway, you can e easily see how this could uh, decay into uh, serious civil discord. Okay, uh, basically, uh, this information is uh, uh, in a study that NASA funded by the National Science Academy. Uh, it's entitled Severe Space Weather Events, Understanding Societal, Societal and Economic <laughs> Impacts, and it's 2009, if uh, you want to look into that in more detail. Okay, so anyway, given the potential magnitude of the impact on this, it's really appropriate that as a nation, that we prepare to mitigate the impacts of this event. Uh, we can't really avoid uh, the event. Uh, we can mitigate the impacts, and uh, to mitigate the impacts, that means to know, we need to know what's coming, and we need to know how the system is going to react. We have to have a national response plan and a protocol in place. Okay. So managing the threat. So where are we today? Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, the elements of space weather. I haven't been watching time. I... Okay. Uh, okay, so if you've got a problem, there are certain things uh, that you need to do. You need to understand what the problem is or the threat. You need to understand your vulnerability. Uh, in, in the world of science, it's always nice if it's a physically-based problem. You like to have a physics-based model of the threat so that you really understand it as opposed to just observing it uh, like we did for the weather for, you know, thousands of years. Uh, we like to have a physics-based model on our vulnerability. Okay, how does it interact? I mean, that, that the physics-based model gives you the exquisite understanding you need to exquisitely attack the problem. It's not necessary to have the physics-based models to uh, to take mitigating action, and you can actually solve the problem without any uh, physics-based model. It just allows you to optimize the situation. Uh, given that we have a threat and we have a vulnerability, we need a warning system needs to be in place. Uh, and then once you have a warning, well, if you get warned, what are you going to do about it? Okay. And uh, presumably, uh, what you do about it uh, puts in your defense mechanisms and it basically creates your immunity to the threat. Okay, and then who's going to coordinate all this? That's the mission leadership issue, you know, uh, whatever the problem is. And then in this particular case, uh, you have to be committed in the long run 
to keep your defense mechanisms current, on track, and ready to respond. The green basically says we don't have, we're in, we're in good shape. Uh, yellow means warning flag. Red means we got a problem, and uh, orange is uh, between red and yellow. Yeah, it's a problem, but you know it, it's it's not a disaster. So anyway, okay. So let's talk about our warning system. Uh, this is where space comes in. We have reasonable warning capability in space. We have several satellites. We've understood the science for uh, uh, adequate understanding of the science for several years. And we have active satellites that give us a warning and an infrastructure to, uh, to take the raw data, to generate the warning, and to distribute the warning. At, uh, two facilities are run, one by the uh, NOAA at the Space Weather Prediction Center and at the Air Force Weather Agency. Okay, that is, uh, that's very good. It's a major accomplishment. And it sort of all happened in the background in the last 20, 30 years. Okay, uh, what we're missing here is what's our response protocol? You know, we get these warnings. W what does our leadership expect us to do? Do they expect the power operators to turn off the power systems and lose millions and millions of dollars? How good are those warnings? What's the probability of a false warning? You know? And the answer is, is right now we don't have a response protocol. Uh, in terms of immunity, uh, we don't have a, the ground system, we don't really understand our humidity. You, you, Im, immunity, excuse me. Um, okay, I'll wrap it up. Uh, okay, so, and right now, we have plenty of organizations that are engaged in the science uh, and the warning aspect of space weather, but nobody is engaged in pulling together a national response. That's where we are. Okay, and likewise, the commitment to fund these satellites that we have up there that give us the warning. Every time you go for funding, it's a battle. Uh, the ACE system, which sits, sits a million miles out between us and the sun, uh, every time it is 10 years past its design life. It will be replaced in 2014. Okay. So uh, I'm going to just skip through uh, page the space weather satellite missions. We have plenty of satellites that have helped us study the satellites. The key ones are the Stereo and the ACE. These are the ones that are provide us with our early warning. Uh, these missions are not a matter of national safety. Uh, not, they are a matter of national safety, not of science. And uh, solar weather does not inherently threaten humanity. Uh, our critical dependence on susceptible technology is what the threat is, and they can bring down, uh, compromise that technology. Uh, and then as we move forward, uh, we have to establish a clearly defined authority to oversee, uh, oversee a comprehensive national solution, not just a warning system. Uh, we need a commitment to that solution. Uh, we need well and clear, uh, clear and well-defined national response protocols. We need public education and outreach. If you warn the public that they don't know, well, what's a coronal mass ejection, then they're not going to respond even though protocols are in place. Uh, we need to engage the international community. We're all in this together. It's not a national problem. It's a global problem. Uh, the power industry co collaboration is critical here, and they need to overcome some of their economic-driven uh, hurdles you know, to get them to a solution point. We have the national resources and capability to render space weather non-threatening. So let's go out and make it happen.